turning us into even more problems. But um, the school district, uh, it's not that they don't have the money because the money is there. Hmm. It all depends on how you want to spend the money. But Malika, you know, the system is not designed for us hmm. at all. Not for, uh, for us to ever be successful. So until those, um, I say to people, you know, you can tell me Black Lives Matter all you want, but until you begin to change the system and show me that Black Lives Matter, then, you know, I'm not impressed. Mm. What, what kind of moves? I'm not impressed. Mm. What, what kind of moves can we make to, 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 because there's a lot of shifts happening right now. Mm -hmm. The light bulb is going on for a lot of people. All mm -hmm. of a sudden. I, I really don't know what it is. Like why all of a sudden the George Floyd story just woke so many people up when it's been Well, go back to Rodney King. Why did they do it when, when it was Rodney King? There comes a time when there's enough is enough. Mm -hmm. And we're at that period at this time. And I say that not to diminish, mm -hmm. but when you get to be as old as I am, you live through <laughs> a lot of things where there's been this major crisis that something will come up and people will get all, you know, ex was excited and involved. Now the difference this time for me is that there are many more uh, non-blacks. Um, and I, I also have an issue with, when I say issue with, uh, we talk about blacks and people of color and then we, we get it mixed up because uh, people begin to say, well, you know, um, people of color. And I, I'm, I'm not here for black folks. I'm just being honest. People of color don't have the same issues as we do because there is a black white issue in America. That's where slavery came from. That's where racism started. So until you resolve that, then you can't get to the other pieces for me. Do they need taken care of? Absolutely. But, um, you know, it's like you got to take care of home before you take care of anything else. And so I don't mean to, you know, <laughs> be discouraging, but I, I, and I keep saying this for folk, we don't talk about black issues, then let's talk about the issues of black folk and not mix it up with people of color. People of color manage to do some really good stuff on their own without us, and they don't put black before it at all. So, um, <laughs> I didn't mean to go off on that tangent, but I just have to say that there, when, when you see people all um, excited about issues, um, they don't understand necessarily the history. Uh, well, of course, you know white people don't understand the history of America at all because they don't know it. But then we don't, we don't know it. We are, I shouldn't say we don't, but most of our people, we don't know our own history. And so therefore we are very uh, neglect, uh, uh, we neglect ourselves in terms of not being able to pass that history on. Um, you know, you have to pass that on to your kids so they know where they came from uh, in order to know where they're going. So that's one of the things I love about my grandson. He loves history and he studies history. So that makes it, uh, you know, it makes it really great. Um, for him to know where he came from, because you, you need to know that black people have always fought to be free, <laughs> been fighting ever since we've been in this world. So people who think that, you know, they talk about slavery, people were running away and fighting, hiding all the time, trying to get away. But, you know, you don't hear that part of the story. Right. You never hear that part of the story. Absolutely. Um, Kimberly Holmes Ross just joined us. Hey, Miss Ross. <laughs> Is she frozen? I think she's frozen. Yeah, she's frozen. <laughs> okay. Okay. She'll come back. She'll come back and come back on. Okay. Um. So I I I feel like something something major needs to happen for this school to happen in the in the fifth ward, and um, I tell Henry that. I love that he's not giving up because I know he's come across some people who have been so negative. And I mean, I, I've heard people talk about who is, who is he? He's not an education. He's not. A, I was like, but he cares and he's keeping it going. So to me, I think he's going to make it happen. Right. And as more people come around to, 
to support him, but there's still, like you said, at the end of the day, do people care about black black people, about the black agenda, about helping mm -hmm. the black community? Mm -hmm. um, how do we battle that? How do we how do we bust through that? Because we're we're behind Henry one hundred percent, and I see more and more people coming around to support. So I mean, it's going to be a force, but will it be enough? Like, what what do you think we need to do to kick in the door and be like, no, this is going to happen? Mm -hmm. You, you will not deprive or deny us any more. And I, that has to be a grassroots effort, I think. Uh, you know, and that's where it's so important to have parents, people with kids in the schools fighting for this, uh, as well as those of us that are out, you know, don't have kids anymore. But I really think that um, that is one of the missing pieces because if you don't see people complaining and yelling about my kid having to get up and get on the corner at seven o'clock in the morning, then, you know, it doesn't mean uh, so much. People always ask, where is it going to be? Like when Jerome was trying to get to school, school district has property right there at Fleetwood. I'm sorry. So people were saying, so where are the kids going to play football? Who cares? They'll find another park to play football. You don't have to play football on that particular spot. That's a place to build a school right there if they want to build a school or if they want to buy the family focus building, maybe they'll do that. I mean, there's, there's, there's really places that they could do it if they wanted to do it. What's going on with the family focus building? I have no idea. <laughs> I had to step away. <laughs> I, I had to step away from that as well, but that's okay. I had to step away. Welcome, Kimberly. We said hi hello to you before. And then we <laughs> You're frozen. <laughs> Lord, let me, let me tell you, I've been Zooming so much. I literally, I feel like I done ran a marathon. I done left the Zoom, came to another Zoom, was Zooming in between Zooms. Apologize. I am glad to be here. Hi, Mom. Hi, um, babe. <laughs> um, but yeah, so thank you. Thank you for having me. And again, I apologize for being late. I just have been having a juggling act since about seven this morning, but here I am. <laughs> I think we're even more busier now during this quarantine with Zoom. It's like, there's no excuse. You should be able to hit five, seven meetings in one day now. <laughs> That's I, I say that all the time, Malika. I don't know where. But I am busier than I've ever been. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sick of Zoom, actually. <laughs> I'm zoomed up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So, you know, we're we're behind um, Henry in this this effort, and I feel like, uh, you know, it seems like so many people before him have really tried to make this happen. So, what do you think needs to be done a little different, a little different, to to help kick in that door? Well. You know, excuse me, I think he's coming at a great time because people are right in, in, in the mood for kicking in doors. Um, right now, yeah. We're, we're, it's some, there's a moment in time, and, and I think we're in this moment in time where people are making demands, mm -hmm. and no more, and this is what we want. You know, we'll worry about how we're going to get it later, but this is what we want. And I think we have to stand firm in that. I think we have to take advantage of this moment in time. And when I say take advantage, I mean, you're going to push this agenda. We're going to just be quiet about it. We're going to talk about it. We're going to, and, and more than just talk about it, we're going to, you know, push and push and push until people get tired of saying, well, look, they really want this thing. Um, you know, I have to blame, and I, I was talking to friends of mine, um, Generation Xers, um, for being, pretty complacent um, because we were comfortable. Um, we lived in this bubble. I think our parents were very active in civil rights. They were affected um, by discrimination. Um, in my perspective is they wanted to kind of protect us from that and kind of everything is great. Everything is, you know, uh, rainbows and lollipops. And, you know, we, I, don't, I hate to say drop the ball, but it is drop the ball. 
because we became pretty passive in our world and, and thinking, you know, that it's all right. And, and, you know, kind of the equality thing was going on. Mm -hmm. um, as you get older and you look at it from the equity lens and saying, mm, this is not okay. And I applaud this uh, millennials and Generation Z to come back and say, no, it's not okay. And, he and here's what you want. Um, but they're picking up some slack from, you know, a couple of generations behind them. Um, you know, the baby boomers held it down. You know, gen Generation X came and we <laughs> kind of was like, you know, in, in La La Land for a little bit. Um, but that's because it was comfortable and it was a comfortable place to be and not trying to point the finger at anyone. But I think the generation before us said, we don't want our kids to experience this. We want different. And sometimes you got to look at the ugly truths to move forward. So I think Mr. Henry, we're at a good place to do that. Eyes wide open. Everybody's on board. Let's go. Yeah, I think too. I last night at city council, I don't know if you saw it or not, but um, of the speakers, uh, one was um, Nicholas Davis, and it was a young lady. Uh, last name was Stowe, I believe it was. Both uh, spoke, but they were, of course they were talking about uh, defunding the police, um, which you know is their issue right now because that's the issue all over the country. But when you get some young people like that to understand what you're doing, Henry, if you get some, these are college students who have gone through this school system and should know what has happened to them. But if you can get some of those young people who are some of them still in the community because some of them are high school students, uh, but and and I'm talking about African American kids who will pull the rest of their friends in that young group and can give, begin to talk to their parents to get their parents on board because I, I just think that, that that would be a way in which to, you know, which to do it. Um, I like that you brought up uh, the younger generation. Now, I didn't go to grade school in Evanston. Um, I lived on the south side, lived on the north side, and I don't know, I viewed the world a little bit differently. And then when I started high school in Evanston, then I saw the well, it seemed like, you know, black, black people were kind of in this, this bubble with, in La La Land here in Evanston. I was like, y'all are real trusting. <laughs> I mean, it was just a little different. It was a little different from where I was coming from. And um, yeah, I often found myself uh, in some heated race debates because a lot of the black people in Evanston wouldn't back me up on it because they were like, we're good. Yeah, everything's good. You know, I'm like, mm -hmm. okay. So I'm, I'm curious, Nico, from the uh, youth's point of view, um, I've heard millennials say that our generation failed you all. <laughs> um, I, I hear it in Evanston, though. I don't hear it outside of Evanston. What, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I feel fail is such a strong word. Um, Thank you. I would say, <laughs> <laughs> I would say, you know, protect it. Um, like my mom said, we uh, we didn't want to. People didn't want their kids to go through that racism and discrimination and systemic racism and and all of that. Um, so I feel like fail is a very strong word, but my feeling about the whole thing is that if the black agenda, black agendas must be followed and um, funded by black money. You know, <laughs> that, you know, economically, educationally, we must fund ourselves and we must do for ourselves as we saw in Tulsa, as we saw in Philadelphia, as we saw with Marcus Garvey, you know, just to point a few out we have to start funding and we have to start bring our, bringing our own ideologies to the table. But Nico, one of the things that, um, and I'm, the reason why I always bring up the taxes is because black people pay taxes. So that is our money. 
Yeah. And that's our money as much as it is that we, and you're absolutely right, there's a lot of money in the black community if they would invest it. I would say to people, uh, having sit on the city council, I get tired of black people telling me about what their neighborhoods are changing. White people are moving in or Mexicans are moving in. Well, why didn't all your neighbors get together and buy that piece of property yeah. together? I remember saying it to my neighbor next door to me. I could not believe that they let their mother, who had worked so hard to buy that house, and then they could lose it? Come on, you could have asked the neighbors. We would all chip in to help you keep it. But, you know, we got so much pride and something sometimes and just don't move around together. But we do have money in the Black community, but we have to be willing to invest it in our community and in our own people. And people are not sometimes willing to do that. Yeah. And I like the part about removing that stereotype that there is no Black money in the Black community. Right. And I think the, the millennials and the, the, the Generation Zs are calling us out and saying, we can do this ourselves. Right. So, and I, I don't know if we ever had, I think we had the bandwidth, but I don't know if we ever believed that we could. And, and you know, and I think sometimes you just and, and do it. Yeah. I remember Henry and I were in another meeting, another Zoom meeting on the, um, the housing meeting for the uh, reparation, the subcommittee. And, uh, and, and they were talking about the uh, real estate, setting up a real estate um, trust. You remember, you remember that, Henry? Yeah. And we were talking about when Bennett did this years ago. Right. And I remember so well, because it was such a great idea we wanted to buy where YOU is now. And um, he had, we all met at the bank, and he had asked, he invited 100 people, I never will forget it, and asked people to come with their checks for $1,000. Each one of us put in $1,000, we could have bought it, invested in the community, and that would have been it. I think only maybe about 10 of us maybe showed up with our checkbooks. And the rest of them just wanted to, I want to hate to say throw shade, but I guess that's what the young people say, you know, because we started to talk about, well, you know, this person does this, and we, the trust factor, you know, we so we so busy sometimes. I remember my grandmother used to talk about black people never being able to get anywhere because we were just like um, crabs. You know how crabs, <laughs> <laughs> you know, if they start to crawl out in the bucket, the other crabs pull them back down. They don't let them go. And we have to remember that you you you, you can't do that. So when, when Nico talks about uh, our black agenda, we got to really understand that we can have an agenda and that we can follow through, but we got to learn how to trust each other. And the same thing with the school. I'm sure some of the negative stuff that you hear when you say, you hear people saying, well, who is he? He's not in Evanston. That's a big deal in Evanston. Always what? has been. What is that? I cannot tell you. <laughs> I cannot explain it to you. Grew up here, never could understand it. To, well, I shouldn't say I could never understand it because I used to be in it myself. But you have to get out of Evanston and come back to really try to help people who <laughs> see. Wait a minute, y'all. We all the same. Growing up in this community, and this is the honest God's truth, we were not allowed as young people to go to Chicago. Those people in Chicago were different than people in Evanston. So you grew up with that kind of, I guess you call it a bougie kind of thing. But separating, you know, uh, Karen, I love Karen Shavers, but we always talked about the house and, and the field folk. So, you know, the Evanston people have always been house folks. And so we didn't know how to be field folks. Chicago were the field folks as far as, you know, some of the uh, people were concerned. So you had to get through that. You know, it's the same thing with the whole color thing. You know, we still have people who deal with that. So I think it's that same thing. You're not in Evanston, you weren't born here, so you don't know as much as we know. And that's the same thing I get when you when you say you grew up in Chicago on the south and north side, and then you come to Evanston, it's a whole different vibe. And it really is a whole different vibe because people have just not grown up with those kind of thoughts. And you'll meet old Evansonians right now who will really look at you about being an Evansonian. But it's a bubble that needs to be burst because Absolutely. as an Evansonian and growing up here, and like I said, I left for a decade to find myself and then ended up landing here. But it wasn't until I went to work for a decade on the west side mm -hmm. that 
really grew. I really grew and stretched myself past that bubble and, and really knew that things were different for people 45 minutes down the road and really gained a respect for that um, and, and made me work harder to improve not only the lives of people I worked with on the West Side, but the lives of people who look like me here. So you, you have to get some perspective. Um, and, and I think um, these younger generations have that perspective. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where they got it, but they, 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 they maybe it was built in or, or came with something in the water or something. But they, they have it um, at a much earlier age and, and are so much more aware and so much high. Nico tells me some stuff, y'all. <laughs> I'm like, Nico, really? You know, um, they, they, they're just in their thinking. So, you know, forward thinking about the Black agenda. Um, we were talking about defunding. And I think I told him, I was like, Nico, you know, you can't just abolish the police. Oh, I think so. I think you froze, yeah, Kimberly. Yeah, she froze again. Froze. Nico, tell your mom she froze. <laughs> he was on a good part, well, too. I know. <laughs> I froze. I'm sorry. Yeah. You tell me about that? Yeah. It was so good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was I was saying that this generation is really willing to ask the big ask. Mm -hmm. And I was talking about defunding the police. It must be the... the it must be about the police. <laughs> <laughs> Your house must be bugged. <laughs> I, right? <laughs> Keep going out when you talk about the police. So it, it, this, this crazy zone, but yeah, about defunding the police. And Nico and I said, you really can't abolish the police. And Nico said, sure you can. People just change their core values. And I'm like, wow, that's a big ass, Nico. But this generation is willing to make the demands. And I we just have to stop being scared. Now, I'm. Changing core values is a, a big long-term ask, but um, you know, I'm just saying the examples of not to be afraid, and mm -hmm. that is not afraid, and so I think we have to fall in line. So Henry, I applaud you not being afraid, stepping out there mm -hmm. because we're gonna get some pushback. Right. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, um, I don't want to keep you guys uh, much longer, but I did want to bring this up. Um, uh, Alderman Holmes had, had brought up how sometimes we are our worst enemy in it, and I think white people rely on that because it they it was miseducation that mm -hmm. affected us mentally and while we battle each other, and I mean these are things that I had to learn along the way too, um, you know not to publicly go against uh, another black person, especially a, a black leader. You don't want to do that in front of them. You want to keep that you know, in within the family, talk about those things. Mm -hmm. And um, but how how do we get over over that? Don't because I've I've been to some of the community meetings, even with like with the reparations and and so many other meetings, and there's always this battle. There's always this battle where we end up not as one on on one page and so here's this this great agenda for a school in the fifth ward and you're always going to have just a group of us that are gonna mess it mm -hmm. mess it up and then they're going to use that against us like mm -hmm. well some of y'all don't want it so we're going to take the money and do this with it instead That's right so what do we what do we do? What do we do about that illness within our own community? How do we heal it? What what do we yeah, that's, do? It's healing is what healing is what's needed. What do we do about that? And and I believe if we all put our money in together, we could have a school. Mm -hmm. How do we get how do we get everybody all the black people in evanston to to do that i mean and even some black people outside of evanston who know the situation what do we need to do to make that happen I think are we saying the right it, things? what do, are we not saying the right things what what do we need to say <laughs> you know I, sometimes it's, 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 it's sometimes it's a message sometimes it's a messenger um, you know, uh, I think that you, you get, 
uh, I think one of the things that needs to happen, uh, probably even with, with this, is if we begin to get the churches to talk about it, Henry, uh, as, as, a, as something real, um, that might be, you know, that may be helpful. Um, you know, it's not in terms of what they can do, but in terms of the kids and the education piece that, you know, they'll sign, I believe they would sign on to something like that, but you have to get them to where they're making the announcements, they're talking about it. But I see, I'm for one who say, we will ask for our tax, we'll ask for our percentage of tax dollars from the school district. What if you had a hundred people go to a school board meeting and demand that their tax dollars be used for fifth ward school. You have to do something radical. And you know, that's why I'm saying these young people are doing radical things. They really are. And uh, things that is catching people's attention. They um they boycotted uh all of the aldermen last night who had not uh agreed to well, I, I shouldn't say agreed to, but had said that they would support defunding. Now, of course, the whole issue around defunding is nobody understands what defunding really means because I think everybody has their own interpretation of defunding. Can you break and, it down for us, Alderman? Exactly, what does it mean? Well, it, it means different things to different people. You know, I, defunding to me, I don't like the word and I would never use, I don't like using it even because, no, I don't want to defund the police department. Do I want to look at it and, uh, and, and, and rework it? Absolutely, because we know we have to address over-policing, we have to address the racism, we have to address all of that, and we have to address the services that they provide that they don't need to provide. So with that, I'm willing to look at that budget and see how some of those monies can be shifted. We will always need some type of, of, of public safety. I think Nico's right, changing our core values, but you're always going to need some kind of public safety. It doesn't have to be the kind of police department we have now. Really doesn't have to be that, but uh, you know it can be something different. So I think it means different things to different people. But when it came on TV and the action out of Minnesota has been about the police department, and people have sort of caught on to that, and that makes it so negative, and it's not um, it's not acceptable to the majority of the community, black or white. Because black folks know what we need. We know what we need in our community. And, uh, and the other thing is that we have to admit uh, that you know we have issues in our community. We can't hide behind that we don't have some issues because we know who's breaking in houses and stealing and doing that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So we have to understand that there has to be some kind of um, uh, accountability for that. So, you know, that's one of the things that, um, that happens with the police. So I hope, uh, we had a meeting last week, I think it was. We, you were that meeting too, didn't we? Uh, and we were saying the kids need to define uh, what they mean by defunding. Because a lot of people don't understand what they mean and, uh, and take it the wrong way. And I had uh, looked at, um, uh, in fact, I had called, I called my alderman and said, uh, wait a minute, now you signed on to defund the police, what does that mean? And then she told me and shared with me what she sent in writing to the kids, which wasn't defunding at all. Yeah, you embrace what they're trying to do, but here's what you have to do in order to make some people listen to you, just to reevaluate the budget, because it's all going to start with the budget. Uh, and, uh, you know, they have to understand they have to do some of that work to look at the budget and make suggestions, uh, you know, to the council who will make the final decision. So, um, but if you had a hundred people who show up to the school board and say, you know, just like they show up and say other things, they can show up and say, we want our tax dollars to go toward a school in the fifth ward because our kids are being miseducated, left behind. And see how they react to that. I think that would be, that would be something to see. But you have to have a shock piece to it to catch, uh, to, you know, to catch attention. Yeah, so I was gonna say a couple things. Um, well, you're exactly right, Ms. Holmes. You know, plugging into that, that young energy is important. Mm -hmm. Started to have some conversation with that group that's leading that 
um, to fund the police. I'm with you. I, I'm comfortable with the word and I understand what they're trying to do. I just wish there was a different way to mm -hmm. a different term that's that's applied. So, you know, connecting with the Nico Rosses of the world and that group, I mean, those are all important elements of making sure we get the support. Church support is huge. Mm -hmm. I met with that group last year. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, we haven't talked kind of next steps, but, you know, always in contact with Dr. Neighbors and uh, Pastor Dillard and Pastor Cherry. So, you know, just keep uh -huh. that we'll have to figure out, you know, how to engage them more, and, you know, with my fraternity connections, you know, connecting with the, the Greek organization um, in Evanston is also key. A couple of things I want to talk about uh, the elements of the vision that Ms. Holmes talked about, and that is the importance of making sure that the school has a community element to it, a support with it. So we just don't want it to be a nine to three school. We envision for the school to provide wraparound services for the, you know, for the families and for the students. So, you know, I met with, uh, talked to Joanne Avery, who runs Family Focus. I said, hey, you know, how do you feel about making it a requirement that this new school have a community, you know, support system added to it? And she said, yeah, she's like, absolutely. And she said, I actually thought that your vision of the school uh, would have been competing. I said, that's far from the truth. I said, a community school model requires the support of family focus, of why, I'm, of why, I mean, you have to have that to be a community school. So, you know, when we talk about, you know, people potentially blowing it up, <laughs> yeah. you know, people not understanding. So there's an element of, you know, just, ed just education on what the vision is for the school. The other piece is, you know, we want it to be a STEM school. So, we say STEM mm -hmm. because we really want it to be special. We just, we don't want it to be an inferior school. We want it to be superior. We want, you know, our kids to thrive in that environment. Uh, a lot of people think of STEM as being this elitist thing. It's like, you know, this is about making sure that the kids are learning. So it's about hands-on learning. It's about experimental learning. So, you know, a lot of kids have problems with just sitting in classrooms and hearing lectures all day long. You know, it's beneficial for these kids to get up and, you know, touch and hypothesize and, you know, I mean, that's, that's what learning is, is it, that's what this type of learning is. And so a lot of people need to be educated on that. So, uh, you know, I think we'll need to think through it when we talk to Dr. Horton about it. He, he's supportive of Fifth Ward School, which is great. Um, he wants it to be the best school in the state of Illinois, which is great. Um, you know, we just got to figure out how, how we do that and we'll stay in contact with him and, you know, collaborate, uh, especially on the funding piece. That's what I'm angling for is just making sure we're working collaboratively on the financial piece. How do you pay for it? Because the school board can do it. This is ridiculous. They don't need a referendum for this. Right. I don't want to see a You're referendum right. for it.